Today we'll go over the tree, starting with some general knowledge on hierarchical data that will come in handy. Shortly after that, we'll cover the formal background on the properties of a tree. Then we'll talk about some of the terminology associated with trees and their parts, along with a visualization of what they might look like, before jumping into the different types of trees. Then, finally, we'll talk about some common implementations of the tree in computer science. Feel free to skip around using the timestamp shown on your screen now. Before we start though, you should definitely catch up if you haven't already. You can do so by clicking the card in the top right corner or the link in the description below. Both of these will take you directly to a playlist containing all the episodes in our Introduction to Data Structures series so far. For those of you staying though, let's hop into trees. No, not those big green things that inhabit the outside world and that you can climb on and get fruit from, rather the computer science data structure, which is a lot more fun in my opinion. Now before getting into trees, we need to talk about data structures in general. Every data structure that we've covered up until this point has been stored linearly. Arrays, stacks, linked lists, all of these had a definitive start and end to their data, and you could easily point them out if told to do so. Everything was nice and neat and easy to visualize. On the other hand, trees store data hierarchically. What does that even mean? Well, it's best to show you with an example. The most common real-world example of hierarchical data would be a family tree. Each person would be an element in the family tree, and connections wouldn't be based on a simple linear fashion. Rather, connections would be more abstract and could lead to multiple paths or branches. Each generation is ordered on a hierarchy, which is where the name comes from, and as you can see, there's no definitive end to the family tree. This is hierarchical data in the flesh. Another example could be a file structure on your computer. You'd have a base folder, such as your desktop, and then inside of that you might have multiple other folders for types of information, and at the end of the line you'd have your files. Again, it sets up a network of these files on different levels, just like how we had with the family tree. Now I mention hierarchical data like this because it's the main type of information that trees are used to store, which begs the question of what exactly is a tree? Well. A tree is an abstract data structure which contains a series of linked nodes connected together to form a hierarchical representation of information. The actual information is stored within these nodes, and the collective is what's known as the tree. This is sort of like a linked list, only instead of each node only pointing to one location, it has the option of pointing towards multiple, and also branching off on its own and pointing to no nodes. Each of the nodes in a tree are called vertices, and the connections between vertices, which connect our nodes together, are called edges. One thing to note is that there is only one path between any two vertices. You cannot have more than one edge connecting two vertices. A good way to think of trees is like, well, a tree. You have the trunk of the tree, and then the branches which come off of them. Now there are a lot of different configurations that a tree can take, and with that comes a plethora of terminology about certain nodes, vertices, and just the structure of the tree in general. So what we're going to do now is go over a lot of the terms associated with specific nodes based on where they are in the tree and how they're connected to other nodes, while also visualizing the general structure of a tree at the same time. A two birds with one stone situation. So starting off with the things we've already mentioned before, a vertice is a certain node in a tree, and an edge is a connection between two nodes. The first new thing is that every tree starts with what's known as a root node. This is always going to be the topmost node of a tree. Let's add a node with the integer 50 to serve as our root node. Next up, let's connect two vertices to our root node using two edges. These two nodes that we just added are what's known as child nodes, since they are both connected to the node containing the integer 50. Child nodes can then be defined as a certain node which has an edge connecting it to one level above itself. Vice versa, the root node, the vertice containing the integer 50, is now what's known as a parent node to these two child nodes. Thus, we can define a parent node as any node which has one or more child nodes. Think back to our family tree example. If we were using people instead of integers, it'd make a lot of sense that the nodes directly connected to each other have some sort of familial relationship. Now let's continue on by adding two child nodes to the node containing the integer 20. When we do this, the 20 node becomes a parent node, and the two nodes we just added become child nodes. 
We have branched off from the 20 node in that these two child nodes, containing integers 10 and 15 respectively, share no direct association with it. Speaking of the 20 node, since it doesn't have any children, it is what's known as a leaf node, or a node in the tree which doesn't have any child nodes. In this context, the 10 and 15 nodes would also be leaf nodes. Finally, let's add one more node as the child of the node with the integer 10, and there is our tree in all its glory. As a quick review, the 50 node is the root node, the 20 and 30 nodes are children of that root node, and the root node is thus the parent of the 30 and 20 node. Then, the 10 and 15 nodes are children of the 30 node, and the 30 node is a parent to both the 10 and 15 nodes. The 5 node is a child of the 10 node, and the 10 node is a parent to the 5 node. Finally, the 5, 15, and 20 nodes are all leaf nodes because they do not have any children. As you can see, one node or vertice on our tree can have many different titles depending on where it is in the tree and what other nodes it connects towards. For example, the 30 node is both a parent node to the 10 and 15 nodes, but also a child node of the 50 node. The 15 node is both a child of the 30 node and also a leaf node as it has no children. This terminology really comes in handy when we start talking about trees which contain thousands of vertices and edges, and the data becomes very complicated to order and define. Moving on, the next two pieces of terminology I want to go over with you guys are the height and depth of a tree. The height is a property of the tree itself, and the depth is a property of each individual node. Let's begin with the height. The height of a tree is the number of edges on the longest possible path down towards a leaf. So, in our example, since the longest path in our tree is from the 50 node to the 5 node, and there are three edges in that path, the height of the tree would be 3. Now the depth of a certain node is the number of edges required to get from that node to the root node. So, let's say for our 30 node, since there is only one edge connecting it on the way to the root node, its depth would be 1. For the 15 node, however, since there are two edges which separate it from the root node, the 15 node would have a depth of 2. And that is height and depth in a nutshell, not too complicated I hope. That's pretty much all you need to know about the terminology associated with trees in computer science. Now there's probably something that's been scratching the edge of your mind for quite a while now. And that's why the heck are these called trees? They look nothing like trees. Trees are not upside down like this would suggest. Who named this data structure and why? Well there is actually a simple answer to this. The tree is said to have been invented during the 1960s by two Russian inventors, and the last time that a computer scientist got up from their chair and went outside to actually see a real tree is rumored to have been in 1958. So please forgive them for the confusion when it comes to naming conventions. They must have just forgotten. Anyways, moving on to types of trees. Now regular trees are great, but their power can really be heightened when you start messing around with how the data is actually stored within them. By imposing rules and restrictions on what type of data is stored within a tree, and also where, we can effectively use the tree structure to its full potential. I could talk about the different types of trees for a long time, so long that actually a few of them have their own episodes coming up in this series, but for now I just want to cover a popular variant, the binary search tree. A binary search tree is a simple variation on the standard tree which has three restrictions on it to help organize the data. The first is that a node can have at most two children. This just helps make it easier to search through the tree, as we don't have to spend time looking through each of the eight children for a particular node, or however many children the node might have. Keeping it limited to two helps us do this. The second restriction, or property, is that for any given parent node, the child to the left has a value less than or equal to itself, and the child to the right has a value greater than or equal to itself. This might seem weird, but it comes with certain advantages and disadvantages over using normal trees, which we'll get to in a bit. The final restriction put on binary search trees is that no two nodes can contain the same value, and this is just to prevent weird things from happening with the structure of the tree. Now how do imposing these restrictions on a tree actually help us? Well, the biggest advantage of a binary search tree is that we're able to search through them in logarithmic time. Because there is natural order to the way that the data is stored, it makes it extremely easy for, to search for a given value. Logarithmic time, if you remember back to our episode on time complexity, 
was the one where we got more bang for our buck the greater number of elements, or nodes, we had in the data structure. All we have to do when searching is say, go left if the value we're searching for is less than the root node, and go right if it's greater. Wash, rinse, repeat until we find our desired node. This makes binary search trees really popular for storing large quantities of data that need to be easily searchable. Of course, this also translates to inserting, deleting, and accessing elements within the data structure, but for the most part, searching efficiency is what really sets the binary search tree apart from the rest. Alright, stepping away now from binary search trees and into trees just in general, let's now talk about some common uses for them in computer science. The most common uses for trees in computer science include storing data with a naturally hierarchical structure. These are like the examples we touched upon at the beginning of the episode. Datasets like file structure systems, family trees, a company's corporate structure, all of these could be stored and implemented using the tree's data structure very easily. Outside of representing data, and just in general, when we put restrictions on trees, like in the case of the binary search tree, we can expand the use of the tree even further. At the beginning of the series, I said that some data structures might not look like heavy hitters, but they provide some special functionality which sets them apart, and the tree is a perfect example of that. Its base structure is incredibly useful, and it can be modified in so many ways which only add to its functionality. One of those ways is through what's known as a try, and is the next data structure on our agenda. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. These videos can sometimes take quite a while to research, script out, and create visuals for, not to mention the audio recording and editing process. In total, these episodes can take up to 12 hours start to finish, so we appreciate you sticking around to the end. If you like this type of content and want it delivered to your subscription box free of charge, click the link on the right of your screen now to subscribe to the channel. As an added bonus, if you click the bell next to the subscribe button, we'll tell the big ups at YouTube to notify you when a new video is uploaded for no additional fee. And if you can't wait that long and are craving more of my melodic voice, you can click the playlist on the left of your screen now, which will take you to a playlist containing more programming fun. Until next time, peace.